Welcome to the Operators Podcast. Today, we are going to talk about how January went with our businesses and what we're doing, especially when it comes to international. We'll even have Sean Frank play a little uh, fix my problem for me, and we will make our suggestions about how Ridge can overcome a good problem that they're dealing with in their business. Thanks for joining us. All right, guys, Operators Podcast. Jason, kick it off. How was January? You know, January was pretty good. It's hard to compare. I I think um, in terms, like, we've reached such scale now that the growth numbers, they don't look as, as awesome, even though they are still awesome, right? Like, we were up over 50% in January. Um. But like when you grow 100% a year for a few years and then you see 50, um, it's uh, it's different. But th- you know, there's a lot of things that were specific to January for us. But um, <clears throat> put it this way, I'm expecting February to be better, though. I'm, I'm curious. We talked about this a little bit, Sean, when we went out. Um, Amazon crushed for us. And even adjusting for the fact that last year, in January, we were low stock on Amazon because we had sold a lot um, in December and we'd pushed it a lot because we were out of stock on uh, on our D2C site and it was this knock on effect. But I think we were up 100% on Amazon in January and well, we're up 150% on Amazon, on Amazon in January. But I think when we adjust for the fact that there wasn't a lot of stock last year, it's probably more like a hundred percent on adjusted basis. So that was really, I was really curious uh, as to why that happened. And I think that didn't happen for you, Sean, you were kind of like the opposite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Jason learns big number, harder to comp. So yeah. it does not surprise <laughs> me that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're slowing down a little bit. It's like, he's coming into chat being like, yeah, you know, we did a billion dollars last year and now this year we got to do 5 billion. It's like, yeah, it gets a lot harder to get that number up the same speed. Um, we are the, we're the opposite. So we were up, uh, north of 30%. Uh, I don't know the, I don't have the exact number yet, but I mean, solid enough growth. Uh, that's accounting for like, you know, you're coming off of, we had like multiple back to back eight figure weeks in November and December. Then you got to account for those returns. And that, that takes a punch to the face. Like we had two days on Shopify that were negative, which is the first time that's ever happened. So like when you go from selling, you know, a $5 million day. And if your return rate is 5% of that, that's a quarter million dollars. You got to, you got to account for someplace else in the future. So, um, with that even being said, Shopify was up a lot. Amazon tough comp year over year. We use the same Amazon team that Jason uses. So, uh, it's definitely not a team issue if he's crushing it. We're not, it's just, we were looking at all of the Amazon search metrics, like Amazon puts out some really, really great insights and reports. You can see what's going on. Our category year over year, while it's on Amazon, destroyed. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I think we just sold so many wallets in November and December that, like, year over year, the category was down like sixty percent on Amazon or something crazy. So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it was just it was just brutal. But at least we weren't. We comped, which is which is always super good. Um, and yeah, Shopify was really strong. Rings are really strong. We sold out of travel stuff, but in general, it's like, you know, when you get out of a sauna and you got to get in the ice bath, you're all warm, you're sweating up a little bit, having a good time in the sauna. That's November, December. January is that cold, cold ice bath just wakes you up. Um, but yeah, we're getting it done. Mike, how was January for you? So January was very good. Um, because we're so omni-channel, it's becoming more and more predictable. Like we don't move as quickly um, or as violently, but it's more predictable what's likely to happen because a a lot of our revenue base now comes from things that are sitting on shelves that we know are going to be there. We know historical traffic patterns, things like that. Um, You know, the most interesting thing that I think happened, a couple most interesting things, uh, had a lot of success with Amazon Canada And we're really starting to ramp up Amazon International in a few places. And we really feel like 
that can be tens of millions of dollars in, in revenue for us. I know uh, different, uh, probably all of us have had some international expansion. We have not been able to do that with our D2C experience because we don't have 3PLs in other places. And unfortunately, our stuff is a lot more expensive to ship than like, you know, a Ridge wallet. So excited about international expansion. And then uh, we had we had a day where we had our biggest hour in company history, which was awesome. Uh, like I was talking to somebody yesterday. I think our particular category continues to behave a lot more like shoes. That's become the comp that I that I like. Especially because shoes works with men or women, you know, like you think about Nike and what they're doing with drops and how people will pay a, a lot and they're they're really coveted and obviously women in shoes um, is a thing. So seeing how limited drops and, and style and stuff just continues to win the day. And then most recently, it's been interesting to see one of our biggest competitors actually hit some adversity after a period of kind of having lots and lots of tailwinds that they've had kind of the other side of the PR cycle. And it just kind of reminds me that uh, of a blog post that I read years ago, it was somebody who was a, a PR person in Silicon Valley, but they were talking about literature and how like the, in literature, there's this common kind of plot device of you kind of introduce something and you see their ascension and you build them up and then you tear them down. And then there's kind of a rebirth and a rebuilding up. And that we tend to do this with, with companies and even with celebrities in our culture. So it was really fascinating to read at the time, but I think I become a bigger and bigger believer that that, that um, even you know some of the companies we talked about like Meta, there was definitely you can trace out that cycle with Meta over the last you know ten or fifteen years, and the way that they've been viewed. And so anyway, hey, so Mike, we've we've seen yeah. So two things that you mentioned that I think are really interesting. One is about international, and then the other is about what happened with that competitor. Um, so on the international. Um, you know, Sean and I both, we, we don't have our own three PLs there necessarily. We have, we work with an agency and they do all of the work. I mean, Sean might have his own three PL, but we've, we held off on say on Canada for a while. And I'm actually really kicking myself that we did because we absolutely murdered in Canada in November and December. I highly recommend like it's, it's not that hard to set up. And uh, you want to talk about expensive to ship? Hello, Hexclad. Okay. So we've got and, and big boxes and everything else. And I just was looking at this this morning. International is approaching 20% of our revenue. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a fantastic number, Jason, because we, some of our team was looking at Lulu and Yeti and some other comps. And, and really, it seems like that 17 to 22% tends to be you know, what the really established consumer brands are at. So the fact that you're already at 20 is really impressive. Yeah, we're just getting started too. Like there's a lot of yeah. stuff that we haven't done yet or haven't focused on. You know, we've been, we've been, <laughs> I just found out today that we're sending emails in Germany and English. I know I didn't find this out today. I found out a couple of days ago. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you, let's go offend an entire country. You know, like the only thing worse would be to do that in France. I mean, like, how do you send email? I'm like, stop sending emails until you could do them in their language. You know, like maybe in the Netherlands and, and places like that and the Nordics where they like really, really speak English. But like Germany, we're sending emails in English. So like we're, we're doing well and we're, we're in like <laughs> shittily. So the other thing that was interesting that you mentioned about, you know, about the competitor, right? It just goes to show you like how like the vol on press and PR is so high and it's like, you know, you can't argue with crazy. So it's like it's it, that should be the panzerism of the day. You can't argue with crazy. But I had a bet. I had a, a more relevant one today. But, you know, we see this, too. I was actually just talking to someone because like. Everyone is out there talking about chemicals all the time. And it's like, and they, they latch on to one thing. So like everything is a chemical. Water, water is a chemical compound. Yet people are like going nuts. Oh, I mean, like, listen, good for Simple Modern that like, you know, a competitor kind of got, you know, got in the butt 
a little bit, you know, because I'm I'm team simple modern all the way. But you know, it's 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 really unbelievable, like that this that this stuff happens because it's happened to us too, and we have something really big that that's that's going to just absolutely like blow all this stuff out of the water for for our business. That's we're not announcing yet, but like the the fact that they're going on and on about just they they find a buzz term that scares people, and it's like it's nuts. Yeah, it's pretty, especially with this particular issue, what's interesting is that it is in no way dangerous, but the word lead sounds terrifying. And the idea that, you know, lead could be anywhere near you. And my wife and I were having a conversation about it at dinner one night, and I was explaining to her the rigorous testing that a Stanley or Simple Modern or anybody has to go through. And and it is very comprehensive. Um, But I was like, man, here's the reality. If people probably don't have any idea how much they're exposing their kids to lead by buying third party stuff off of toys off of Amazon, for example, like there is so much that the, where the real risk is, is in a lot of areas that they're not thinking about it. And especially, I mean, to me, this has always been one of the biggest liabilities Amazon could potentially have is if you sell directly to Amazon, they vet your stuff and they are looking for safety reports and you have to do a ton of compliance. We're, we're shipping, we have a PO that they cut nine months ago for Europe and it still hasn't shipped because we're working through the compliance issues. That's how comprehensive it is. Like every single part of every single unit has to be safety tested, but then they're selling a bunch of stuff from China that's gone through no testing. And it feels like to me, the whole, we're a marketplace, you know, so we don't have responsibility. It's on consignment thing. That's just not going to work. Yeah. It takes, uh, you're totally right, Mike. It takes, it takes one big lawsuit, like, like one big push and that, and that falls apart. Team is trying the same thing. It's like, no, we don't infringe people sell in our marketplace. And like, yeah, try doing that in the EU. They're like, no, fuck you enforce your marketplace. So it, it is a big liability. Now, I wanted to talk about international, but we'll talk about that hero's journey that that competitor is on. When I talk about overexposure of a celebrity, like this is what I'm saying. People love you and love you and love you until they are fucking sick of you. And it's the reason why, you know, Brad Pitt does one movie every two years, but people make fun of Nick Cage because he did 12 movies in fucking a season, right? It's like at a certain point, they just have too much of you and, and they hate you. And people look to bring you down. Like that's what happened with this particular competitor. I'm glad we're not saying the name. Uh, just they're a darling, they're a darling. And then eventually you're hydro. I'm not, and I'm, this is just me accusing people of doing stuff. This is just, I'm totally making it up. But you're a big publicly traded company, Hydroflax, known by Helena Troy. They're like, Hey, w- how can we win back market share? It's like it takes one angry reporter to put this out there in the world. Um, well, and I'm, I'm I'm cynical enough that I'm like, you know, I'm it's it's not obvious to me that a competitor didn't, you know, place that or, or didn't cause that to go viral with a bunch of you know likes that they bought off of a Chinese click farm. Like, there's a lot of money at stake here. And but I I think that the point that you're making, Sean, is one that is very clear, which is. When you get extreme notoriety, we know that how humans respond to that, that it's, it, you get to this kind of maniacal like acceptance, and then it becomes very cool and very trendy to just rip that thing down. And, you know, because another thing that happened, that same competitor is Saturday Night Live did a, a whole skit that just dogged on it and that was really widely shared. Both those things happened in the same week. And just like they probably weren't deserving of the level of hype they ever got to, they weren't deserving of the level of criticism. So there's that operator party that just feels, even if it's somebody that's a competitor, you feel bad for them. I mean, there was another example. This is a little bit different, but our friend Katie, who's in uh, one of our chat groups, uh, there, there was a competitor in the kids space that it took, a, took a misstep uh, that may kill the company on social media. We, we haven't talked about that, but like, it really shows we're living in a new world where social media can so quickly build you up and then also just as quickly tear you down. Dude, it's always better to be number two. That's the Microsoft strategy of the past 20 years. It's like, you know, Meta was the like Mark Zuckerberg was this genius 19 year old. Everyone loves him. He's going to change the world. And then he's the public enemy number one from 2016 until basically TikTok comes out. Right. And, 
Same thing with Amazon, same thing with everybody else. Google getting sued for antitrust all over the place for being the number one search engine. Microsoft can do whatever deal they want. They're a $3 trillion company. They have Bing and Search and they're buying gaming, whatever the fuck they want to do because they're number two. So uh, it's a good day to be number two. Yeah, and and Microsoft probably learned that firsthand of at one point being number one and having to go through antitrust and and all that stuff. And it's it's actually remarkable the run they've had. Like if you look at at stock performance and just they've they've crushed it basically over the last several years. But like you said, Sean, some of their heritage is that they learned they they learned being the monopolistic power and the number one person means you get all the focus that you get all the governmental scrutiny. Dude, I mean, you guys remember this. In the 90s, a massive lawsuit. I think it was a multi-billion dollar settlement because they put Internet Explorer on the computers that shipped. And how else would you get on the internet? Like that's that's what I remember thinking. Like, how else would you would you be able to get other browsers? But it was that was a huge fucking deal. So I think they definitely took the second spot. Do you think the like teardown thing has to do with how fast somebody rises versus how high they rise? Like what's more important, right? Like the speed at which this company has gone to the heights that it has or that it got there in, in, in the first place. You know, I look at like a Lulu who's kind of been at the top of the game for a long time. Nike's been up there for a lot, but they've all taken a long ass time to get up there. And they've never, like, I'm sure they had their moments where they were like viral and, and whatever. But like, I wonder if that's a factor in this case. Where it's just gotten so stupid. It's a great question. Here's a another interesting data point that I was thinking about this week. Do you guys remember in 2012 when the whole narrative was how Samsung was coming for Apple and that Samsung was the cool brand and they were going to take Apple down? And it just did not happen at all. Like at all. But there was a moment where, I mean, 100% of the press was uh, it's if actually if you pull up a stock chart you can see when it happened because apple's like all time low of the last 15 or 20 years or something happens during that period um so uh, and that was an interesting example where like it really was the narrative but apple just shook it off and and it's a good question of why um but i, I do think there is something to what you're talking about matt that we America tends to worship the idea that you can have the overnight success story, but then you kind of resent it when people have it. And maybe that's insecurity of, of people that it's like, you don't, you don't like the idea that somebody else had this ascension or this overnight success and you haven't, I, I don't know, it's the but I, I think there's something there. theory, right? It's yeah. the speed at which you rise is the, is the same speed at which you fall. It's the boiling frog. It's one degree at a time. You never notice. Right. And so like, if you're, if you're just and no, nothing brand, then you're everywhere. People are skeptical. They hate it. And you just boiled the frog from going from zero to, to, to flash boil. But slowly over time, people can just you know get used to it. It's a jacuzzi for them. The other reason why that might be true is that it building like real moats and real value that's anything other than just kind of hype and word of mouth takes time. And so it, when you're usually when things like blow up overnight, well, we're really talking about things that are blowing up based on trendiness and trendiness is like you live by that sword and you die by that sword. Amazon has never won on trendiness. I don't think that I've ever, ever, it's ever been like, oh, they're the hot thing right now. They've won on what they can deliver and people wanting that thing. And so maybe that's why the half-life thing is so true. Like there's a, there's a corollary idea, Matt, that the, that's, that's somewhat similar, which is the quicker you rise, the, the same speed that you rise at is the same speed you can be disrupted by a competitor. And I think that that's absolutely true. And maybe this is an offshoot of that, that the speed that you become trendy and the, the violence with which you become trendy is the same amount of violence that someday your fall is going to be marked by. We're, we're deep in 2024 right now, and I actually just sat down with my team. We were going through um, our production planning and just just looking at how we, far we've come and how in- integral Fulfill has been to it. I mean, there's no way we could be having this conversation right now. We would be just dead in the water. Fulfill has really changed our business um, when it comes to managing our stock and our inventory and and on the back of that being able to do really strong demand planning 
And it's funny because I was hearing about uh, in chat a, another a vendor of uh, inventory management software. And uh, we actually onboarded that vendor like the day I started at HexCloud in early 2020. And we never went live with it. It was that bad. So you can make really, really bad decisions in this area. You can literally burn tens of thousands of dollars and not have it work, not have it even ever go live. And uh, we implemented Fulfill uh, at a key time in 2023. And uh, Q4 was a monster for us. And we wouldn't have done it uh, nearly as well without Fulfill. And this 2024 planning that we're finalizing now, our production planning, like I just don't know where we would be without it. Well, Jason, I'll go ahead and say someone in, in chat is trying to set up NetSuite and they said, hey, we got quoted uh, 12 months and like $250,000 in setup costs and no software on earth should ever take that long to set up. I would literally rather quit this industry and go be, I don't know, a, a farmer. Yeah, barista <laughs> didn't spend 12 months setting up in software. So for Phil's promise is it won't take 12 months. Uh, and Jason's using it right now to plan 2024. And Jason, just quick ballpark. You think it's going to be three or four billion this year in sales? Is that what you're planning? No, but we're going for like high double digit growth this year. <sighs> so he, another huge year in the Hexclad family powered by Fulfill. Hmm. All right. Now we can talk about international. Yes. Well, actually, Matt, you, you didn't answer the question. How was your January, bud? January was good. So similar to yours, Sean. So we had, uh, so peel the case, I think we're trending up like 20, 30% right now. Like really happy with how this year's starting and efficient, which is even better. Um, you know, Lomi, uh, we actually sunsetted our V1 of our product on D2C. So like we're on to connected device now. So January was a bit weird, but we're beating budget by... I don't know, 30, 40% at this point, I think 30%. So it's happy. Um, Meta's ripping, man, for a PLA case. Like I'm, that's part of the reason I started buying more stock. And I'm like, holy shit. Like this is I, like, I'm, <clears throat> everybody's happy. I'm happy. I'm a dumbass trader. I'm just going to buy more Meta stock. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so I, I think I, <laughs> I think I spent 30 million on meta last year something like that i mean i'd have to i'd have to actually check it's one of our biggest marketing channels yeah imagine if i just bought the stock dude like this whole yeah. time if we would have just did one to one <laughs> like that's, but that there's fallacy in that too because you did that with peloton and you got snipped um, that's true that's true you know I, everybody says that with tesla for years right instead of buying the car buy the company and you know that that holds true that's just like you know survivorship bias um, but there's no question that like, I think I'm much more surprised by January than I, like I was expecting it to be pretty soft. Like for some, I, I going into January, I just thought the consumer overspent in Q4. I like, I keep looking at this damn savings, right? I dropped it in our, um, message, our message group and it just keeps going down. Like Americans are running out of savings. I'm like, there's no way I just assumed Q1 would be soft. Um, so, so far, I'm pleasantly surprised. You assume that people would have discipline and stop spending before they ran out of money. And that's I think that's, that's a, where you went wrong, bro. It's a poor assumption. Uh, it's a poor assumption. I think you're right, Jason. I, sorry, Mike. Um, yeah, I think I need to stop trying to bet against human behavior. Ameri us Americans, I'm going to lump Canada in this because we're no better. Um, we just like to buy shit, right? It's like, it's our therapy and it just continues until it doesn't one day. So right now it seems to be continuing. Yay us. Um, like you guys, international, Europe is doing really well for Pila right now. Uh, it, like week over week, it just continues to climb. And I, I, don't know, I don't know why. I'd love to say that, that we're doing that. But I also kind of think that maybe we're catching some macro there. Like it was so, sh it was like, I mean, they've had a fucking hot war. Um, for like over a year now, right? I'm just wondering if that's starting to normalize a bit. Like people forget the the train crash in the background and like people are starting to spend more there, but I'm really happy with international performance at the moment. Now I'm trying to figure out what the fuck to do with it. What's yes. the move? You know, what do you mean by that? 
Uh, Matt, do we, I mean, so like, you, should, sorta, you should tell them like, stuff. Yeah. That's, that's like, my take. So, look, like Europe's going, but I don't know why. And whenever something works and I can't point to effort as the reason, like a move, I kind of want to go figure out like what's going mm. on, number one. And, and mm-hmm. then number two, should we put some effort in? Like that, and I think that's the the question circling in our company right now is like, should we actually take a country, probably Germany, because that's our best one, just like everybody else, um, and just really try to like genuinely localize the business in Germany. It's interesting because we've been having this internal conversation. Obviously, international is a huge expansion opportunity that we're we're taking advantage of. But I was ta- I put my CFO and and another member of my team on just kind of doing some analysis. Their takeaway was, and I, I don't know if I agree yet, but this was their take. Their take was, even if you look at the the Lulus of the world, that what seems to drive their international penetration is u s. growth. that more or less, like that that's the causal agent. And uh, obviously, like, we're not at those brands scale, but I did think that that was an interesting idea because their analysis was just like, as that brand becomes more and more dominant in the U S that basically seeds the ground for it to be more and more successful overseas. Hmm. Why do you think that is like, Sean, do you have a take on this? Like, I, I feel like that's a popular culture thing more than anything. Like if something is trend, like more of the world's, I mean, I'm just going to give you like my take on like the last 20 years, most, you guys know this, most of my family is Italian. Last 20 years of like going back and forth to that country, I've watched it visibly go from like they have their, what looks like their own sense of style and identity to more and more Western culture and fashion and design and brands work its way into, in this case, Italy, right? I don't know if that's happening in all of Europe, but like, my first time in Italy in the early 2000s, French fries weren't a thing. I go back 20 years today. It's like, I can go get fucking French fries now. I'm like, when did this happen? Right? It's like, it's on menus in restaurants. Um, you know, I'm seeing American brands on people there. And I used to never see that. So I don't, I wonder if you're talking about just like overall pop, popular culture and American culture influencing these places now as opposed to sales level in, in a place. I think, I think it's global hegemony. Like we're all, we're all reaching, you know, stasis and it's not, it's not America's winning in all these places, right? Like for kids, kids who are like 15 and on TikTok or even younger, 13 on TikTok can name Italian designer brands. And like when I was growing up, like the, like the rich kid brand like was Abercrombie and Fitch. And like now kids like know about Chrome Hearts and they know about fucking stuff that costs like fifteen thousand dollars to get to get decked out in. So I think because of the internet, I think the world's just way more global. Um and it, it's like that in Asia, it's like that in Europe, it's like that here. It's just like we're all kind of just re- liking the same things because we're all human. Mike brought up the like the best in class brands have fifteen to twenty five percent of their revenue coming from international markets. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I think I think Yeti's seventeen. Now luxury brands typically have like you know an LVMH of the world has thirty percent of the revenue, maybe fifty percent of the revenue in the U.S. So the majority of the business is is all of these different geos distributed. I think that's because it, there's rich people everywhere. There's one percent everywhere, and that's the most global audience you can reach. Like if you're reaching a one percenter in China, that person has a passport and goes to Paris and goes to America. Like they're going to be exposed to like the best in class brands. But if you're like a mid market brand, I think yes, one, it's, I think it's, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. That and there's hegemony of like Louis Vuitton is Louis Vuitton, and that's what the most expensive thing. That's that's what the richest people buy anywhere. But that next tier down, where you're buying whatever the the high mid market option, that might be very different in Italy and China and the U.S. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what like what I would point to is like uh, Richard Mill- Millet. Like he makes watches that cost like four hundred thousand dollars. None of us have them. To have one of those watches, you really need to have at least five hundred million dollars, like for it to make sense for you to buy, like you know, to be a customer. 
Now, how many people globally have five hundred million dollars? Maybe five thousand. So it's like he doesn't really fucking care where his customers are, just wherever those five thousand people are. So it's like he's gonna he'll find them. <laughs> they could be they could be in Dubai, they could be in Seattle, they could be wherever. He'll find those people, right? I mean, Lamborghini, Ferrari, it's the exact same fucking thing. Um, I think that actually the reverse is true, Sean. They find him, right? Like the that's the thing with that kind of product is they like there is no marketing. It is they are built purely off of like those fo- like that is such a small community that they all talk just like all communities do like when you get down to a small enough pool of people they all kind of buy the same thing um you know like in the town i'm from i always joke with my wife that my wife's family they all had the same fucking coffee maker mm-hmm. like everybody like they all went to costco and bought the same damn cuisine art coffee maker and, and it's like there was 14 houses and every one i went into same coffee maker and I think that the, the, so, that principle is the same with that particular, like those kinds of brands. It's a, one, it's a, one th- oh, go ahead, Mike. Well, I just, I just wanted to, uh, never mind, finish your point, but I, I wanted to come back to this, this, like the point you were making about watches. Cause it's something I've thought about recently. Anyway, what were you going to say, Sean? I was just going to agree with Matt that like you, you want to fit in with your community. Okay. Like that's what it comes down to. So if your community is the people you live next to, like, yeah. I'm going to buy a Stanley water bottle. I'm going to wear a Lululemon. I'm going to buy the Cuisinette coffee maker from Costco because like that's what my community does. And if your community, I mean, rich people are people. Like if your community is old guys on yachts, you want to you want to get a yacht and you want to get a 18 year old girlfriend and you want to get whatever because you want to be just like your buddies, right? And it goes, it's the same thing with, with watches. So it's whoever your community is, that's who you want to fit in with. Now we could actually, I would like to hear Mike's point about watches as, as the watch aficionado of the group. Yeah, no, uh, with my very expensive Apple watch. No, uh, I was just, I, I did some research on wealth and I just thought this was interesting. So basically, if you think about wealth, um, how many millionaires do you guys think there are in the world? Just up top of your head. There's, a, I, I know that there's a fuck ton of them. It's 10%. There's a lot more States than you probably. think. Uh, because, and, and some of this I think has to do with real estate. There's 60 million people that are millionaires. If you go to six, I mean, I guess, I guess it's your, your definition of a lot, 60 million people, physical lot. Um, how many people do you think are decamillionaires? So basically there's a big drop from millionaires to decamillionaires because now real, you know, just your home and happening to be, you know, I happen to live in Santa Monica, like doesn't get you there anymore. What do you guys think? How many people are, okay, wait. Yes. Okay. How, well, let's just do fit. Yes, yeah, do fifty million. How many? Do you, how many people do you think are above fifty million? Oh God, that's a tiny number, man. Like I'm gonna 100, say thousand. Yeah. Like I don't know. I'm like under a million people for sure. Two. Yeah, it's two hundred sixty-five thousand. And anyway, the the relationship that's interesting here that I wanted to point out is that basically. 50 million, 100 million, a billion, you have an order of magnitude change. So 50 million, 265,000 people is, is this estimate. Um, 100 million, you drop down to 25,000 people. And a billion, you drop to like 3,000 people. So it's like at every one of those tiers, you go down an order of magnitude. And I don't know why, but that was super fascinating to me. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, every time you go down the tier, you probably, the average age goes up fucking 20 years. So it's like, it's well, like, and who knows how much of it's generational also. Like that's the other thing that, that jacks with this is that at some of these, you know, when you start getting up over $50 million, you know, I would guess, I don't know, half of that is been, has, is generational. Maybe not, maybe I'm overestimating it, but a lot. I'll be really honest with you. The cost savings is probably the biggest driver for me. I think I'm going to save like over $100,000 a year switching. And there is nothing I would not do to save $100,000 on SaaS. <laughs> like the, the, whatever the darkest thing you're thinking, yeah, that's me trying to save money on SaaS. So that's a big driver. And uh, look, I, I believe in the product. I've seen it. I've seen the demos. People, people are like, oh, is not migration going to be a pain in the ass? Yes. That is why I did not migrate in Q4. It's never going to be painless to do one of these things, right? Like I've been on Clavio for 10 years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time and effort to put it in, but 
Jimmy is the type of guy who's committed to make it as seamless as possible. So I'm very, very excited to switch to Send Lane. Um, they're a startup, man. I think their culture matches mine. I'm excited to be there. So Photoshop a Send Lane logo on my jersey because that's where I'm going, guys. <laughs> Love it. The other thing that we've seen from social media is people will over leverage themselves to buy physical goods. Matt, like you, you're often people love buying shit. I'll meet guys that have like $2 million and they're trying to fly private. I'm like, bud, this one flight is 15% of your net worth. Let's figure, let's figure your fucking life out first, bud. Like you gotta be, you gotta be, you, you're, you might not be flying spirit. You might not be flying Southwest, but like your comfort plus, bud, like let's, let's just, let's, get your stuff worked out. Uh, if, if you had, if I had heard that earlier, Sean, I would still have one of my kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm judging you now, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you don't need both. Uh, okay. To, to reground the conversation international talking about the 15% penetration. Yeah. Uh, the EU is an amazing market for us. It's the fastest growing market. It's the biggest market. Matt, we're just like that. The UK, talking about that separate, I think is in a recession and has been in a recession for probably two months. The UK is having the hardest time out of all our markets to scale. We we can have similar results in the EU or Australia, but like the UK is just is just harder right now. Could be us, could be them. Who knows? Um, and you want to see a terrifying chart, by the way. And I don't know that th this is just a longer term trend of the UK. If you look at the UK's growth in total GDP over the last 30 years, it's a horror show. Like they were, they are getting much poorer relative to the rest of the world. And it's a trend that's not just happening right. Uh, and, and I say much poor, they've been a lot richer than the rest of the world. That's their starting point. But the rate that they're growing their, their wealth and their GDP is like way under most of the comparable countries. Yeah, dude, post that up. Yeah, I mean, it's still a great market. It's a good market to get into. Um, I think I think a mid hundred, like 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 a mid nine figure brand should be getting about twenty percent of the revenue from international markets. We're gonna try to get that higher. We're gonna try to get half of our revenue from international markets by twenty twenty six. So we're launching. Oh, like I like that goal. Where did the, why did you come up with half? Or was that a, a thumb in the air, or was that a like? There's some thinking behind it. If growth trends continue, it'll naturally hit 50%. So uh, it's, you know, 15 to 20% of our business and it's growing three times faster than everything else. So like if we just charted it out, it's like, oh yeah, it should be 50% of our of our revenue. And it's it's like what the comps are. Like if our comps are uh, a coach or if our co co comps are a Mont Blanc, most of their revenue is outside the United States. It's like... So anyway, we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna try to we're gonna try to reach that, and um, it's going pretty good. I'll let you guys know how the global store goes. If you listen to the operators podcast, if you're in the Slack group, you'll see all those those developments. I got a problem in my business I could talk about. If you guys want to talk about problems, I loved, yeah, dude, absolutely. Like Jason said, it's it's not fun to hear about just people winning all the fucking time. So let's talk about a problem. Okay. Well, this is, this is going to be like a, a humble brag. Okay. So, so maybe it is me sure. winning. It's like, oh man, like I'm too rich. It's one of those, those type of, bra <laughs> those type of problems. Uh, my plane broke. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my boat only has two jacuzzis, that type of shit. Uh, Panzer can relate. Panzer's, Panzer's up. He's like, he's in his mansion and like uh, this beautiful, like Riviera basically. And he's like, Oh yeah, they're, they're going to tear it down and my pool's going to cost 300 grand. So, um, <laughs> so here's the problem in my business guys. Uh, we launched travel. Okay. And it's, you know, it's carry on, it's, it's luggage, it's bags. And we, we wanted it to be a hit. So we bought what we thought would be like, you know, a November to like an April amount of inventory. Because that's about as much time to like, we could figure out what sells, we can get another order in, you know, Chinese New Year cut off, like whatever. We sold out of everything in like January 10th. <laughs> so one reason why this month has been so hard is that like this new growth vector of our business that seems to be taking off like crazy, uh, we cannot get enough bags. So like we had to cut ads, we had to like... Um, 
um, pull wholesale stock, pull Amazon stock, pull international stock, put that to your website. And if you go to our website right now, we have two bags in stock and they're always coming in and out of stock. Um, when we have two colors. So it seems like we need to get a hundred thousand of these things made this year. And the, you know, that's impossible is what the supplier told me. The supplier came, uh, to visit us in Santa Monica on what, Tuesday and we were there and I'm like, yeah, I need a hundred thousand of these fucking things. And he's like, yeah, next year. And I'm like, no, like right now. And he's like, dude, we come back and it's going to be March 1st. And like, we're going to, we already have an order in. So yeah, that's my problem. I don't know what the solution is. What, why? Why? Sorry. I mean, I, I know you posted this in chat in one of the chats too, right? But is it just a, is it a raw, like what's the, have you actually dug into like what slows them down? So like, is it raw materials? Is it parts? Like what about the product has such a long lead time? And, and I asked that because like during COVID we had this issue with um, parts for Lomi, uh, like the chips and shit. And we, we got creative with how we got those for our manufacturer. So like we sped them up by like three months. Yeah. So the, the challenge is, you know, if you look at her carry on, and I'm not trying to talk shit on other carry ons, but like when away got popular, everyone just made away clones. And so like, a, like if you know what an away bag looks like, they have all the same wheels, they have the same, tr it's called the trolley system, the handle, like, and you can get those from a ton of knockoff brands for as low as a hundred bucks or whatever, 150 bucks. And they're more or less the same. So everyone just has optimized the supply chain to make these. We we have we have a different type of trolley system, a different type of wheels. We think they're better, they're more expensive, they're harder to make. And one one company makes them. And that company's like, yeah, dude, no one, no one has ever ordered a hundred thousand of these. What the fuck are you talking about? So it's it's getting it's getting those up to speed and getting those made. That's like the big challenge. So it's a great bag, by the way, Sean. Uh went on a trip in, at the end of December where took it and you can feel the difference in quality. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it, it's funny. I actually was gifted in a way bag. And so I used it and then I used the one that I just bought from you. My, my son used it and we, we used both of them on the same trip. So I really had like the side by side, but that's also the problem of being innovative and doing things better is that those things don't scale as quickly, you know, like there's probably not been a, a customer that wanted anywhere near the volume that you wanted of that thing before this point. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, we're, we're, we, we developed a lot of custom parts or whatever. So like, you know, and originally we're like, yeah, we probably want 25,000 of these or, you know, 40,000 total or whatever. Now it's like, okay, we, we double or triple capacity. Um, basically like the order is we'll take as many as you can possibly make, like make as, like as soon as you come back, get a new factory, make as many of these. And I'm just like, have you guys ever, like, what do, what, do you just accept low growth? Do you? Hold on. Why don't you, have you thought about doing what we did with Lomi, which is like, uh, put the, put them all on a pre-order, but show people the shipment dates and show them the uh, amount that's already sold. So let them buy five months in advance and just tell them your delivery date is now July. If you miss this window, your delivery date will be August and your cash conversion cycle will be the most beautiful fucking thing in the world. If the demand is there and you can, like we did that for, dude, I did that for 12 months, 14 months. <laughs> No, I didn't try about it. That's that's why I asked you. This is with that, but that's a good idea. We're gonna write that down, and maybe, maybe that's what we do for new color releases. And we just be like, hey, if you want that one, yeah, go ahead, Jason. So Sean, on the on the, pre I was actually thinking pre order too. Like the minute you said that, and it's interesting because I just bought um, this small wine refrigerator that I got literally bought off an ad because it's that cool, and basically I paid for it like twelve hundred bucks. And it's not shipping till March. And it was just like, you get in now and it's going to ship in March. So they had pretty good visibility into it. I don't know what kind of visibility you have. What you don't want to do is like tell people when you're going to ship it and then miss. We've got a lot of operators fans out there. A lot of people using North Beam. I use it every single day. If you want a higher level of planning and accuracy out of your MTA solution, North Beam is the tool I use. Jason's on board with their multi MMM, MTA. Yeah. You know what's really what's really cool about having a partner like North Beam 
is that I, I give them feedback and they make changes. Like they they create they change their dashboards based on things that I told them as a C level exec I care about to make it be useful to both the media buyer and the senior execs who may not like I'm not pulling levers in the ad account. I, I'm not capable of doing it. Uh, Sean is capable, but I hope you're not doing it anymore. I'm sure you're not doing it anymore. Like the fact that they uh, they sort of develop the product in a way that it's still it, it's actually really useful in different ways to senior people and media buyers, I think is was is pretty special to have a partner like that. No, no, no. We didn't do that. Like we had our supply chain, like we had pretty good visibility into the entire supply chain and we knew when things would be hitting. So we would update our PDP every week with here is the next shipping window and people would order based on like, this is the next shipping window. And that, and it was right on the PDP, right? It was like, it, and the trick is you got to show like January sold out, February sold out. We're now shipping like March is the next window. It's this percent sold out. Like you really got to be specific and accurate and honest, but it does work. Cause like, dudes, I mean, I mean, we talk about luxury all the time, but like the number one thing in luxury is scarcity. And if you've got real scarcity on the product and it's that good, my donkey didn't bring me mine. So I don't know if I'm going to get them in Canada or not, Sean. I'd love to try it. I'll yeah, buy yeah. it whenever you get them next time. Yeah, so, um, no, the scarcity like, thing. Well, I was just going to say, I, I would go a different direction than the pre-orders. I would go the scarcity route. What What I would say is turn the scarcity into an asset instead of a liability. That the fact, listen, there's obviously product market fit here. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm thinking, well, I'm going to make great freaking margins on these because if I can sell less, I don't have to, I can probably sell a lot without doing any advertising. So, okay, that's a huge win. If you, if you can sell whatever, it's called 40,000 uh, suitcases this year, but you do it with zero ads, that's a huge win, right? And then the, the second thought is, I think this sets up great for limited edition color drops that are even more expensive. And you need to raise the price. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the, the pricing thing, people will be less price sensitive if there's scarcity. And so go for it. Take advantage of that. These, these, are, these are good practical tips. Um, but yeah, Matt, we, we couldn't get them to Canada because we had a shipment going there. We had to pull it back to satisfy US demand. But eventually, we will try to get them in international markets. I, I will, whenever you, if you're going to get them, if we're going to do something in March, that's that's the, the the hint that we might do an event in March for people listening to this uh, in LA. Then I, I'll order one and just pick it up when I'm there. I'll just I'll just come by the office, but I'll just give you one. Um, you know, and if if we're doing an event in LA, if it's going to be intimate like we talked about, we should do it in Santa Monica, and then we could I could host it at my spot. So, or we do it in downtown, and J Jason can host it. Um, we can do it in the Hextide Warehouse. But Sean, you know. It really is amazing. I mean, just congratulations on opening really two totally different funnels, totally different categories for Ridge. And it just goes to show you that you've built a brand. You know, it's really because I remember, you know, Danny and I talking, we talked about Ridge a lot. And we're like, where, where is the next thing for Ridge? And this is like two years ago. And boom, proving people wrong. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, thank you guys. Rings, super fucking easy because there's a whole industry that makes rings. They're really lightweight. You can air them. Like it's not hard with the rings business. The carry-ons, it's like, it's like because there's so much custom shit. They're like, the, the guy's looking at me. He's like, I, he's like, no one does this. What the fuck are you talking about? Um, so we're working on it. But I, I love the idea of doing stage, like, hey, get in line now, place your order. We'll ship it to you when it's ready. Yeah, you're, always, you're playing on both. At that point, you're like, I, we don't want to block people out. You're, you're leaning into scarcity. Um, you can just do some really cool things if you open that up. I don't know. You know well, like, and the, the reason why I say the scarcity thing is so big is that we have, we stumbled across the scarcity thing last year 
And what we're seeing is the longer, the more we lean into these ideas and the longer we go, the more uh, dramatic the magnitude of them is. And so, because you can start to train your customers, like what, what you would hope is to train your customers where if they get an SMS from Ridge, they're like, I better look at this. And if I'm anywhere, in, anywhere close to interested, I better click on it and buy it right now. Not like maybe I'll come back to this tonight, but like I know that if I want to get this thing, I need to act right now. That's powerful. And if you can start to condition people that way, uh, it's it's one heck of a, a way to um, post some pretty explosive sales. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. guys. Well, we'll thank you for with my problem. All right. That's a wrap. Episode 42. That was kind of fun talking markets and Amazon and Meta and all that good stuff. So look, if you're new to the show, thank you for being here. If you've been here for a while and you still don't subscribe to our YouTube channel, what the hell? Go hit the smash, go smash that uh, subscribe button uh, and follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get this poison. That's it. We're out.